that is a song that we need to hear. It's a song we're going to, I think, continue to do for worship in the future. Um, and as I think about that song and I think about God's faithfulness, his promises that are still true today and they won't change, God made those promises, they're in the word, and he's the same today that he was back then and will be forever, and he hasn't gone back on his word. I don't know a time in my life where I can say that God has failed me. How about you? There may be times where, where I'm looking with my eyes going, I, this doesn't make sense to me. And there might be times where I'm looking at my circumstances and saying, God, are you here? Are you involved? But I can always tell you when I have hindsight to look back and God has shown his faithfulness. And I don't know what we're going through here today, but I know that as I looked at the early service, I was looking at people that I know for a fact, if it hadn't been for God's faithfulness and the fact that he does things like move mountains, change circumstances where, and made ways where there didn't seem to be a way there would be people that were sitting in the early service this morning that shouldn't have been. But God worked a miracle. God did some kind of a healing or provided in some way. And how many of you have stories like that in your own life? You know that God has done things in your life. He's made, made something possible that was impossible by, by man's terms. I'm so thankful for, for his power and his presence in our life. And this morning we're talking about trusting the Lord. And uh, I believe our ushers have some cards. You guys got those? Uh, they're going to pass out some cards to you this morning, and uh, my message this morning is trust in the Lord, and so you're uh, getting a card that's got a, it says memory verse on, and on, the, on the top of it. I want all of you to have a card. Everybody in the room gets a card. We should have enough for everybody, and uh, so I want you to take that card, hold on to it. We'll come back to it in a moment, but uh, this is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Some of you maybe have put that to memory. And uh, the rest of you uh, should, because it's an important, uh, important message from the Lord that we need to hear today, and we're going to look at and talk about. So while they are passing that out, I want to just, um, just share a few thoughts. Psalm, the psalmist asked a question in Psalm 119. He asked this question, how can a young person stay on the path of purity? Or how can a young person, or how can anyone keep their way pure? You know, we live in a culture today uh, that's filled with sexual images, that's filled with sinful attractions, and everywhere we look around us, there's temptations that want to fill our minds with things that God would not approve. So how do we stay pure? How do we stay spiritually pure in such a contaminating environment, and how can we keep our children pure? The truth is, is that we need help. We can't do it on our own. We need strength and wisdom more powerful and dynamic than the influences that are tempting us. And the psalmist gives us the answer to this question, how can a young person stay on a path of purity? And the answer, he says, is this, by living according to your word. We need the word of God. We need to read God's word. And we need to do what it says. James says in James 1.22, don't merely listen to the word and... What does he say? Deceive yourselves. If we're just a hearer or a listener to the word of God, then we're deceiving ourselves. He says, don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says or put it into practice. We have to start by hearing. The scripture says that faith comes by Hearing, hearing the word of God, hearing the good news of Jesus Christ, Romans 10, 17. The psalmist goes on in 119, 11 to say, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So I don't know how many of you have uh, put this to practice, memorizing scripture. Maybe it was something that you did when you were in Sunday school because you got a star on a chart, or uh, maybe your parents did something where, you know, you got to eat that day if you memorized a, a verse. I don't know how that worked in your life, but I, my suspicion is that as, as adults, even as uh, some teenagers here in the room, that's not a practice of ours. Uh, but 
the psalmist says we need to hide God's word in our heart. And if we're going to stay on this path of purity, it's going to come through the word of God. And so I challenge you uh, to study. The scriptures over and over tell us to, to read, to study, to meditate, to memorize. Joshua 1.8 says, study the book. He says, keep this book of the law on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you'll be sure to do everything written in it. Only then will you be prosperous and successful. We need the word of God actively involved in our everyday life if we're going to be successful and prosperous in this world. I'm not talking about making money. I'm talking about living a prosperous, successful life for the kingdom of God. The Bible says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, meaning money, things, stuff, but loses his own soul? We need to be successful by God's standards. De- Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting in verse 1, it, he, uh, he says, These are the commands Moses said, decrees and laws. The Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that, so that you, you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. The word of God is supposed to have a prominent place in our lives. I want to just read for you the note in my Bible Life Application Study Bible on Deuteronomy 6-7. It says this, the Hebrews were extremely successful at making religion an integral part of life. The reason for their success was that religious education was life-oriented, not information-oriented. They used the context of daily life to teach about God. The key to teaching your children to love God is stated simply clearly in these verses. If you want your children to follow God, you must make God a part of your everyday experiences. You must teach your children diligently to see God in all aspects of life, not just those that are church-related. We tend to have this dichotomy of our life. We've got the church life and then everything else, our Sunday life or Wednesday life or whatever, and and then there's the rest of our life. This has been God's plan all along for every generation, that we as parents teach biblical principles That we teach the scriptures, the truth of the word of God to our children so that they will do them. And then our children who have learned these things and put them into practice then teach their children and their children's children. I want you to notice what the scripture doesn't say. It doesn't say take your kids to church every Sunday. Make sure they're in Sunday school, kids church and youth group and pray that those two hours a week will stick and help them get where they need to go in life. See, I, I, I believe that church is important. I believe that all these things, Sunday school, kids' church, where else we wouldn't be doing them? We wouldn't be dressing Pastor Weaver up in a funny hat and goofy clothes to tell you to come to Sunday school if we didn't think that Sunday school is important. But nowhere in Scripture does it say to do that, but over and over it tells us that we are to, as parents, as grandparents, to train our kids and instruct them and lead them. So what we do here is supplemental. This is, is this, what do I got to do to that? Is that better? So this is supplemental. It's going to be reinforcing. I don't know if that is right. All right. It's reinforcement for what parents and grandparents are supposed to be doing with their kids and their families every day. All right. So everyone has a card? If you've got a card, hold it up. Anybody not have a card? Everybody has a card. Okay. This is your card. You could write your name on it if you want to. It's not necessary that you do. Um, but we, um, we're going to say this verse together. And I know some of you have it memorized. 
And uh, for those that don't have it memorized, I hope that you will put these verses to memory because these are uh, very important verses. And uh, so I want us to read it together. If you'll start with me, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Some of you, your version that you learned, it says he will direct your paths. It's the same thing. Uh, Trust in the Lord. Put all your trust in the Lord, not in your own understanding. Acknowledge God in everything, and he'll direct your path. Let's read it again together. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. That's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 talking about trusting the Lord this morning. You know, it's amazing uh, what we put our trust in. We trust a lot of things in this world that we probably shouldn't. How many of you have ridden on an airplane? You know that airplanes fly at 600 miles an hour plus, 30,000 feet above the earth, and some of them crash. Why do we do that? I think even, even uh, worse is that we get in cars and we drive these cars around on streets, and we don't even know who's driving in the other cars, that they're even a competent driver, that they're even paying attention. But yet we still do those things. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't. I'm just saying we put a lot of trust in things. But over time, what we learn as people is to not trust very much. I would say that if you were honest today, you'd say that there's not many people in your life that you truly trust. We've learned to not trust people. We've learned that if something is too good to be true, that it probably is. So we're pretty negative thinkers, you know what I'm saying? We've learned not to trust because people have failed us. They fail us over and over and over again, and sometimes it's just hard for us to take a step of faith and trust people. But we're talking this morning about trusting in the Lord, and as the song, it's not just songs and a, a lyric of a song. It's, it's scripture that tells us that God is faithful and we can trust him. George Barna, you've heard of George Barna? He does a lot of surveys and studies, and uh, there's a survey that he did of, of those who are self-described Christians. Over 1,800 people that he surveyed, and here's just some interesting things as we talk about making the word part of our everyday life and trusting God um, and not ourselves. This is, this is self-described Christian people surveyed. Four out of ten Christian people strongly agreed with this statement that Satan is not a living being, but a symbol, uh, simply a symbol of evil. Forty percent strongly agreed. Nineteen percent somewhat agreed. These are Christian people. Much like their perceptions of Satan, a lot of Christians don't believe that the Holy Spirit is a living being. He's simply a force for good. Okay, overall, the Holy Spirit, a symbol of God's power or presence, not a living entity, only one-third of Christians agree with that on on any kind of form. A statement that uh, Christians, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, and all other religions pray to the same God, even though they use different names for that God. These are Christian people surveyed. 30% strongly agree with that statement, that all those religions pray to the same God. 30% strongly agree, 18% somewhat agree, 12% don't know, so a total of 60% of people, Christian people, self-described Christian people, believe that all the same God. If you read our Bible, you cannot say that. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the Savior of the world. Other religions don't believe that. Not even the Jews believe that. We need to know our Bible. We need to know what we believe. I just want to take a simple survey of of all of you. How many of you believe that we as Christians should trust God? Okay, put your hands down. Anybody here here believe that we shouldn't trust God as Christians? Okay, good. (laughs) I'm not trying to sway the survey here. I, I thought that's what you would do. All right, second question. How many of you believe that by fully trusting God that we could never fail? If we fully trust God, we will never fail. Raise your hand if you believe that statement, okay? I don't think we have everybody there. 
okay? So, but the vast majority of you are believing that if we fully trust God, then, we, then we'll be successful. We won't fail. So the last question I want to ask you is, do you fully trust God? How many of you fully trust God? And I mean the kind of trust to the point of complete and immediate obedience. God says something, you're there, you're on it, you're doing it. One hand, two hands, okay? Do we fully trust God? The Bible full, clearly exhorts us that we are to trust God in every step that we take, every area of our lives, our family, our work, our studies. But the truth is, most of the time, we don't fully trust God. At least it's not an instinct for us to trust God. We've got a lot of people who might worry, might be afraid, might have doubts. It's not that we don't want to put our, put our trust in him. It's just that we, don't, we tend to forget to put our trust in him. It's why, like I said, so many people struggle with worry and doubt and fear and those types of things. So I, what I want to talk to you about this morning is trusting God as a way of life, like it's instinct. It's second nature to trust God because I believe as Christians, as believers, that's what we ought to do. I mean, we read the verse in Proverbs, right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. That's a leaning with all of your weight on God. It says don't lean on your own understanding. We're to lean on the Lord. So when we trust God, we need to trust him completely. So is trusting God just something that we say? We know what the scriptures say about trusting God, trust him with all your heart, or is it something that we really live? We know that God's in control of everything. If we read our scriptures, regardless of how, how big or heavy the obstacle is that we're facing, we know the scriptures say things like this, Ephesians 3.20, God is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work in us. Luke chapter 1 verse 37 says, for nothing is impossible with God. Mark says it the opposite way with a positive spin. He says, everything is possible with God. Jeremiah 32, 17, O sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth by your strong hand and powerful arm. Nothing is too hard for you. How many of you believe this, what, what, what I'm reading here in the scripture? That with God, everything is possible and there's nothing, nothing too hard for God. You believe that? Okay. He's a big God. He does big things. Philippians 4, 19, my God will supply all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Do you believe that? How many of you have worried, is, is, is God going to come through? Is he going to provide? What do we know by scripture? It says, God will supply all my needs. Matthew six thirty three. seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you as well. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. So in your wildest imagination, we've not seen what God can really, really do. Romans 8, 31, if God is for us, do you know, do you know that scripture? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Romans 8, 28, we know that God works all things together for good to those who love him. If we believe these things that we're reading in scripture, do you think that we can trust God? Should we trust God? I mean like fully trust God. Like to the point when he says something, we just instinctively say, okay, God, yes, that's what I'll do. That's where I'll go. We know all these things to be true. So why is it that we don't? Why is it that we follow, falter? Why don't we follow? Why don't we lean on him? Why do we struggle with worry, fear, and doubt? I think that it's not that we don't want to put our trust in God, but trusting in God isn't our way of living. I'm not saying there's people in here that don't have faith, but fully leaning on Christ, trusting him with all of our heart. I don't think we live that as a way of life, so many of us anyway. We don't fully embrace what God is saying to us. 
Faith in Jesus means trusting him simply, fully, without any reservation. We trust God. That's what it means to, to not lean on our own understanding. We're leaning on him. Too many times we don't realize the promises of God because we're hindered by what we see, by what we can't understand. See, we know these things to be true, but what I'm looking at right here, that doesn't make any sense. I know that God is a big God who can do impossible things. Nothing's, nothing's difficult for God. But look what I'm facing in life. So we operate by what we see and what we understand or what we lack of in understanding. That's kind of our mode of operation. And we allow those things to stop us from trusting God. The reality is you can't lean in two different directions at the same time. We're either leaning on God or we're leaning on ourselves. I want us all to be fully leaning on the Lord Jesus Christ, to trust him with all of our heart because that's what scripture says, that's the way we ought to do it. And you say, well, I don't understand. You know what? I don't understand a lot. But scripture says that we need to walk by faith and not by sight. We need to walk by our believing and not by our seeing, one version says. It's not that we bury our head in the sand and just act like it's not there. We're just saying, look, I know what it looks like, but I know a God who can do anything. Scripture tells me that. He's big. He's never failed me. He's come through always. It might not be on my time, and it might not be my way. Most of the time, it's not my way, and I'm thankful for that because all I see is what's right here in front of me. I see just this limited view, but you know what? God has an unobstructed, unlimited view of my life and my circumstances. And this is what he says, Isaiah 55, my thoughts are, not, are nothing like your thoughts. My ways are far beyond anything you can imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. God is infinite. We're not. We're small, he's infinite. He knows the end from the beginning, and we see a short part of the now. God knows all the ways, all the why questions, and we grasp for just little bits of, of wisdom. Once upon a time, an African king who had a close friend, uh, that friend had a habit to face every situation that happened to him, whether it be good or bad, by saying, all is well, God knows better. All is well, God knows better. This king and his friend one day went for a hunt. And the friend loaded and prepared the weapons for the king, and apparently the friend missed something in the preparation of one of the weapons. For when the king took a shot, it took his thumb off. While examining the situation, this friend observed, as always, all is good. God knows better. The king answered, no, this is not good. And he had his friend thrown into prison. About a year later, the king was hunting in an area, unbeknownst to him, uh, inhabited by cannibals. They captured the king, they took him to their village, they tied his hands, they piled up the firewood, and when the cannibals came closer to the fire, they noticed that the king did not have a thumb. They're very superstitious people, and they never ate anyone who had part of their body missing. Thus, after setting the king free, they banished him from the village forever. Good for him. When the king arrived at his palace, he remembered the incident about his thumb and felt remorse for the treatment that he gave his friend. Immediately, he paid a visit to his friend in prison. You were right, the king said. It was good that I lost my thumb. And the king started to tell his friend all about his experience and the things that happened to him. And he said, I'm sorry that I have ordered you to prison for such a long period of time. It was a great mistake. No, the friend said. That was the good decision. All is well. God knows better. What do you mean by that? How could it be a good decision? I ordered my best friend to prison for over a year. And the friend answered, if I was not in the prison, certainly I would have been with you on the hunt. 
And you know what would have happened with me. <laughs> All is well. God knows better. That's a silly story, kind of. But how many of you have had experiences that have happened to you where you have been able to look back and say, you know what, if that didn't happen, it wouldn't have made this possible. Do you think that God's up to something? Do you think that God can see things that we don't see? Are you pretty sure that God knows things that you don't know? Do you truly think that with God all things are possible and that he can do things that you can't? But yet we live sometimes like it all depends on us. And if I can't understand it and I can't make sense out of it and I can't do something about it, then I'm doomed to fear and worry and doubt. So we need to trust God completely when we trust him. And secondly, when we trust God, allow him to have every part of our life. Total commitment. All in. Scripture says, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. The Hebrew word for acknowledge is yada, which means to know or recognize. To truly know and recognize who God is. Not just theoretically, not just in theory, but in practice. And put that into action. Engage it with energy, understanding God, his power, his wisdom, his providence, his goodness. Recognizing that putting God, we need to put God in his right place in our life. That's what it means to acknowledge God in all of our ways. Put him at his right place. God deserves first place. There's a lyric to a song that I just heard, I heard yesterday for the first time. And it's a song called First Place by a group called Worship Central Australia. And there's a line in that song that says this, you're either king of all or not my king at all. You're either king of all or not my king at all. We either trust God or we don't. What does it say to God when we trust him mostly, but not with everything? He can be trusted, and we're to trust him. First Chronicles 28, 9, David said to Solomon, And you, my son Solomon, acknowledge the God of your father and serve him with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches every heart and understands every motive behind the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. Proverbs 16, 3, commit to the Lord whatever you do and your plans will succeed. So to acknowledge God in all of our ways is really a total commitment of faith. And we know that without faith, it's impossible to please God. We need to be all in. That scripture goes on to say that anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Romans 12, 1 encourages, he says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. After all, when you think of all that God has done for you, is offering yourself to him too much to ask? It's the right response to what God has done. It's surrendering ourselves to him. And surrender is the channel where God's riches and blessings flow to us. Do you realize that? Surrender and commitment to God is the channel through which God's richest and best blessings flow to us. A man looked up from his hospital bed and he said to his wife, you've always been with me when I've had trouble. You've al you're always there. When I lost my shirt in a poor investment, you were there. When I had the car accident, you were with me. When I got fired, you were there. I realized that in all these misfortunes, you have always been there. Now I believe what my friends were saying. You're bad luck. <laughs> Don't we treat God like that oftentimes? Things happen to us and Situations, circumstances, things don't turn out like we 
wanted or thought or we're having to deal with struggles and trials and difficulties in life, and what's the first thing that we do? Who, who do we blame? God, you're a big God. Why didn't you, why didn't you fix this for me? God, you're, you're able. Why am I stuck in this, in this situation? Kind of goes back to the story about the thumb. That doesn't make sense. So I'm going to get mad and blame everybody around me. But in reality, all is, all is good. God knows better. Can we live like that? That in every situation, in every circumstance, we can say, all is good, God knows better. As a husband or wife, trusting our spouse should, should not be an obligation. It's something that comes or should come naturally. And the same applies with our relationship with the Lord. Acknowledging God in all of our ways requires us entrusting him with our whole being. Everything that we have, our family, our standard of living, our decisions, our everything. Trusting God is a part of daily living. It's, it should be our way of life. Isaiah 26.3, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. How many of you need peace in your life? You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you. Jeremiah 17, verse 5, as the musicians come, this is what the Lord says. Cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans. Cursed is the word. Cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the Lord. They are like stunted shrubs in the desert with no hope for the future. They will live in the barren wilderness in an uninhabited, salty land. That sound appealing to any of you? That's trusting your own human strength. That's trusting your own wisdom. That's trusting other people. But verse 7 starts with the word but, and I'm thankful for those words in Scripture because it says there's another way. But blessed are those who trust in the Lord, who have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along a river bank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. How many of you in your life, you've gone through some spiritually dry times? God's providing for us in those times. He's saying if you trust in the Lord, you will have roots that go down deep where water sources can be. So when everything is happening out here, you've got a source always. Trust in the Lord. Such trees are not bothered by heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. Trusting should be the major component in our life. Trusting God, and if that's lost, then we become incomplete. Trusting God should never be an option. Do you understand? We can trust God always in everything with all that we have. As Christians, that should be the instinct. Well, I'm just, I'm trusting God. God has my back. God has a way. He has a way where there doesn't seem to be a way. We don't just trust him during the difficult times. We don't just trust him during the easy times. We trust God always. And so I asked you this question this morning. What are you trusting God for? What is it that you need to trust God for? That you've been battling on your own. You've been wearing yourself out with worry, fear, doubt, disappointment. But you need to trust God. Have you trusted your life to God's full control? Have you invited Jesus in to be Lord of your life? When I ask you to bow your heads with me, and just asking those questions this morning as, as you have been listening and God has been speaking to you, the Holy Spirit. There's some of you in the room today that you're not trusting God. You haven't, you haven't given your life to him. You're living life your own way, by your own plans, your own understanding, and God is calling you into a relationship with him today. And he's saying, look, I died for you. I gave my life for you. I have a plan for you. All you need to do is trust me. Come to me. 
and offer your life to me. Is there anyone here this morning and you say, that is me. And today I'm coming to Jesus and I'm giving my life to Jesus. Anyone in the room? Maybe you've trusted God, but you don't fully trust. You're not fully leaning. Your life is gripped with worry. Looking to other people, looking to yourself, your own human wisdom, your own human ability and effort, and it will always end up wrong. Encourage you today to trust the Lord. Would you stand with me?